Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor David Kruter today, who is uh, visiting from Melbourne, Australia, with uh, his wife, Professor Sheila Kruter, sitting at the back of the room. David started his career as a theoretical physicist, and he completed his uh, PhD at Caltech. And he grew an interest in neurophysiology under the influence of Professor Jack Pettigrew, with whom he uh, collaborated on several projects and he still uh, keeps collaborating with. During his academic career, David worked at the National Vision Research Institute in Melbourne, the School of Autometry at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, the School of Psychological Science at La Trobe University in Melbourne, the Brain Sciences Institute, and Swinburne University of Technology, where he is now a professor since 2000. His academic interests include neural mechanisms of refractive control, neuroscience of normal and abnormal visual development, psychophysics of visual attention, nonlinear electrophysiology, and functional neuroimaging of cognitive function. And his studies have important implications for the development in children with autism, which is going to be the topic for today's seminar, dyslexia, amblyopia, myopia, and ADHD, as well as for the understanding of conscious awareness and mind-brain relations. David has published over 130, 130 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals and has an extended record of funding from the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council through La Trobe University and Swinburne University over the past 30 years. Uh, David currently holds an adjunct professorship in psychological science at La Trobe University and uh, is a visiting research professor at the Third Military Medical University of Chouchin, China. He's a, a national co-chair of the Asian Pacific Conference on Vision He's on the executive committee of the Australasian Society for Psychophysiology and is the National Imaging Facility Node Director for Swinburne University of Technology. And today David is here to talk about causal visual processes in autism. Turn myself on. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Simona, for... Uh, looking after us so well. Um, we've been really very impressed with uh, Rotoreto. It's a beautiful place. <coughs> Travelling um, a little bit around Europe um, between conference in, in Singapore, the Asia Pacific Conference, and uh, uh, perhaps you know Mel Goodale because he's here a few times and going to his daughter's wedding in, in California, which is in a week or so's time. And uh, it was really wonderful to be able to come and visit. And it, it, it is been superb and um, Simona took us on a beautiful trip around uh, about around Rotoreto last night showing us all the sights. So it was, uh, it was very good. Um, <clears throat> my talk here looks like I'm going to talk about autism and in one way I am, but perhaps more I'll be talking about what autism can perhaps tell us about visual process. And so, if you like, the, it's the understanding of the visual process, <coughs> excuse me, that is very much <coughs> at, um, uh, at the bottom of all of this today. So, autism, as we know it, as a clinical definition, uh, is characterised by a set of core symptoms of, you know, communication difficulties, social impairment, uh, rigid or repetitive behaviours, and so on. And they're very well known, they're, they're very well publicised, there's you know, a bit of a, an epidemic of, at least of diagnosis of autism. Interesting thing is that from twin studies, the correlation between these uh, symptoms is not very high. And this comes from um, Hepe and Plowman and Ronald's uh, work at around 2006. And correlations between what you might think of a triad of symptoms is actually rather, rather low. We've been interested <coughs> in the question of visual processing and perception, and there was a, a seminal paper by um, Steve Dakin and uh, Uta Frith in 2005 in Neuron, and 
going through all of the, at that time, uh, perceptual studies on autism, they identified that there was probably a, um, a magnocellular problem in autism. And that sets the stage for what we want to talk about now. We talked about the fact of these low correlations, and except you know, in 2010, Ecker et al. published a study which is uh, using structural MRI, beautifully coloured, of course, through a support vector machine, discrimination between clinical autistic. Is that me? Am I making that rattle? Cause and effect. <laughs> Hello? Well, what if, I, what if I turn the microphone off? And I talk loudly. Is that better? I'm afraid the recording might be worse, but I think with that rattle in the, in the back, it, it might be a problem if that goes on for the whole time. <coughs> so, as I was saying, this journal of neuroscience paper, Ecker et al. showed that um, taking structural MRIs of about 22 clinical ASD and 22 controls, they found the ability to classify at about 90% those with autism from those without. And those sort of things sound like consistencies that are rather higher than that, that sort of correlation between the, the core symptoms. Similarly, from Fr uh, Dakin and Frith's work, there is a, a common sense of visual abnormality, and uh, that's now been included in the DSM-5 as another uh, sign, if you like, of autism. So what sort of visual problems occur? And, you know, it really comes to whether you can see the face among the leaves or the, the forest for the trees, um, this question of uh, global and local perception. It's actually a harder, much harder problem to understand than it seems. You can look at that and say, yes, I see a face, or if you don't, then you say, gee, I'm worried. Um, but in order to answer the question of how it occurs, you have to actually work along a number of different paths. And so um, I'm going to try to approach this question uh, looking at several different ways of studying visual process. One of them will look at essentially anatomy. So here's a, a monkey geniculate, dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus. Uh, studies, single cell studies show you know, the upper four parvocellular layers of small cells, two lower layers of large cells, the magno cells, and different functional properties such that the, the magno cells typically are achromatic, like faster temporal processing, uh, lower spatial frequencies and so on, compared with the parvocellular neurons, which will quite happily process a fairly fine uh, isoluminate red-green grating moving back and forth, um, like in this case here. But the idea that um, there is a, a magnocellular problem, obviously also comes from, come, and I'll come back to here in a moment, mainly from psychophysical studies, but we have to understand that the, the, the brain structures um, are separated into dorsal and ventral streams, and we are, do certainly understand that ventral streams involved a lot in, in processing recognition, faces, and, and so on where there are noted uh, deficiencies, if you like, in uh, children with autism in terms of uh, recognition and so on. But 
you have a problem in that the, the dorsal stream has a predominant magnocellular input, the ventral stream has a mixed input of, of magna and parvocellular input. And so, for instance, if you had a dorsal problem, if there was some problem with processing dorsal cortex, then psychophysical studies would probably reflect that as a magnocellular problem. And so the, the question of whereabouts along that pathway there is a problem has to be resolved. And the sorts of stimuli you know, that have been used commonly have included motion coherence thresholds, NAVON figures, um, groups, the Dutch group using um, texture-defined objects, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the diamond illusion uh, in a moment. Um, Badcock's group in, group in Perth using ra radial frequency figures and so on. And so we, we want to look at this and we'll be talking today about autistic tendency rather than about uh, uh, people with clinical autism. I'll come and talk about that at the end if you want to think about it. But Baron Cohen et al. in uh, 2001 published a scale. Now, I'm not being disrespectful here, but I'm meaning fluffy in the sense of the questions don't seem to have any relation to what I've been talking about for the last five minutes. Where was the magnocellular parvocellular? Where was the neural basis of anything? It's just, would I rather go to a movie or go to the library? Um, would I, you know, I find making up stories easily or not? Um, I tend to notice details. I don't like being having my mind changed and so on. And so there are 50 questions in this nature and uh, typically we'll uh, present this scale online. We'll get <coughs> bunches of undergraduates of roughly the same IQ um, and be able to classify them into those low and high um, on this process. For the mean of this 50 uh, item scale is about 15 or 16. Uh, and Baron Cohen noted when he was actually uh, validating the scale itself that Cambridge mathematicians had a score of about 25 and, and so on. And there are differences in terms of occupation and so on. That typically engineers and um, uh, computer programmers and so on tended to have slightly higher um, AQ scores and so on. And you can see how it might fit with a uh, the requirements for certain work profiles. But these people, generally speaking, are working and holding jobs very well um, in the community. So I'll be talking about um, the AQ and I want to talk about uh, what it is, firstly from talking about the, uh, uh, the anatomical side and then talking about some of these, but just to try and uh, bring to your mind problems in the literature. If I just take the case of motion coherence, so here are six separate movies. If you look at the literature, there's been about 18 publications on motion coherence thresholds in autism, autistic tendency and so on. About half of them find an effect of uh, difference between high and low autistic tendency. However, most of them have used white dots on black backgrounds, black dots on white backgrounds. They've used high contrast stimuli. Now, interestingly, that's not the sort of stimulus I would use if I was trying to search for a magnocellular difference. These are slow moving dots. The parvocellular system will certainly code these very, very well. They will code these ones at lower contrast rather worse. And so there's a sort of progression here of going to, apart from the different directions, to higher velocities, larger dots, uh, lower contrast. And here, where the dots don't sound, you know, you can follow a dot all the way across here until it gets to the other side. But here, the dots only stay on the screen for 10 frames before being replaced by another dot. And there again, this provides considerable pressure, but very few publications have really looked at the issue of what's the nature of the motion stimulus that they're trying to do. 
So something down in this end here is probably a more ideal um, form of stimulus for motion coherence um, uh, measurements. So let's get back to the question. What are we going to do in order to measure the magnon parvus similar pathways? Uh, yes, we're monkeys, but we don't go around putting electrodes in our heads. Um, we don't know whether monkeys are autistic or not, if you know what I mean. And so we have to try and find ways to measure magnon and parvocellular processing in human. And one of the ways that's emerged over the last, since about 1997, has been to use uh, so-called pseudo-random uh, stimuli. If you look at this, say, central patch, this patch is going like this. This patch here has got a decorrelated sequence of stimuli between black and white. And because of the fact that the concentrating on that central patch is uh, going on and off at the same time in, in a random fashion, we can look at the <coughs> temporal response properties measured by the uh, cortical visual evoke potential and we can look at the question of whether the uh, neural neurons that are um, um, contributing to the evoked response, looking at it as, as a function of uh, contrast, of stimulus contrast, um, and also in terms of the uh, nonlinear behaviour of the response, gives us any signature of the M and P pathways. And indeed, it does. So. I need to just do a little bit of technical work here, but don't worry too much about it. But I presume you understand uh, you know, what a, an event-related potential is. You have some stimuli. I've got some white ones and some black ones. And here, the grey the ones are either black or white. And you imagine I can go through that sequence and set one trigger when the stimulus is white and another trigger when the stimulus is black and essentially average all the white ones, average all the black ones, and take the difference. And that produces something called an impulse response function or the first order kernel of the Wiener kernel expansion. You can forget about that for the moment. But I need to explain <coughs> the second order responses. You all realise when you look at a fluorescent lamp that actually it flickers. And uh, is it 50 hertz mains frequency in Italy? Yeah, so um, a fluorescent lamp here flickers actually at 100 hertz. So every time current passes one way or the other with an alternating current, it flashes. And so you don't see that flicker at 100 hertz. Why not? Well, it's because we have uh, nonlinearities, or filter processes in our cortical system particularly. The, our retina resolves much better flicker than the geniculate and the geniculate than the cortex. And I think we all accept that. But what we have here is a, an ability to actually measure that sort of filter process. And I put it to you that the magno cells and the parvo cells have actually different temporal filter functions. And so we talk about, in the second order response, thinking about two stimuli at a time. So if you imagine you have choices, so take two frames here. This is the frame we're measuring on, but the previous frame could be you know, such that we have white, white, or black, black, or black, white, or white, black. And if you think about it, that if the stimulus has been off, the next time you stimulate with a, say in the case of black, white, this stimulus will be big compared with this, this one here because it's just been stimulated maybe you know, 16 milliseconds before. And so if you took a phototransistor, which has a 20 nanosecond response time, and me tried to measure second order responses, that would be just zero because you have a very, very, very fast system. But we know that our, our brains are not very fast temporally, just massively parallel. And so when we do this, and we can also look at the question of what happens if we stimulate further and further back, if we separate 
the, the reference frame from the current frame, you imagine that if you stimulate here and you get a response, and then you stimulate here, you would expect if those two were far enough apart, say a second apart, that you would get exactly the same response the second time. And then really what we can do is we can look at the interaction time and linearity would, could still be there in the sense that one response could ride up over the other response. But the second order response measures the difference, if you like, of the uh, actual response from the expected response from the first order kernel. And so we have a way of measuring um, as a function, let's say, of contrast here or any binary um, uh, changes in colour or luminance uh, or behaviour. So after that, that's the only technical slide, I think. Um, when we do that, and here's some data collected from groups with low autistic tendency, mid and high, and I'm using this roughly, there's about a, at least a standard deviation on the AQ between these groups. Um, looking at the contrast responses, so for binary stimulation like before at 10%, 25, 50, 75, 95, 70 and 95% uh, Nicholson uh, contrast, you can see some features of the evoked responses. So the, we have here the first order kernel and then the first slice of the second order kernel when you're looking at adjacent frames and the second slice of the second order kernel. And what we'd noticed back in about 1997 was while the, uh, the first, or, first order kernel is yeah, somewhat changeable, you get contributions which seem to come and shift around some of the latencies and amplitudes. In the first slice of the second order kernel, there's a waveform here which is quite unitary, and the second slice of the second order kernel here is quite unitary uh, in the following ways that when you plot their um, contrast response functions, that is looking at the evoked amplitude as a function of contrast, this waveform here grows rapidly and saturates in amplitude. This waveform here is not as big at low contrast, but keeps growing as you get up to high contrast. Also, there is about a 25 millisecond difference in latency and this fits with monkey measurements of uh, magna and parvo cortical activations. Monkey's smaller, of course, so the, the times are somewhat less. But John Monsell and people like that, certainly looking at this data, say, yeah, it certainly fits. So if we take that data from the previous slide and plot the um, contrast response, response functions and fit standard um, Naka Rushton curves to it, you can see the obvious saturation in this first slice of the second order response. That was the one over there. Um, and this is that other, let me just go back one slide. So the M and the P waves are presented here, and I've sort of greyed out the rest of them. And there's something that stands out here, and that is the red curve, that is the group high in autistic tendency, has larger amplitude second order responses than um, controls and low AQ. So that's physiological data. What does it mean to have a larger amplitude? Normally you think of something larger being better. But in this case, it's worse. As I said, a, a fast neurotransistor, uh, sorry, um, phototransistor will just have zero response. So the bigger the second order response, the more inefficient is the neural species that's generating that response. And so if you like, you could say those with high autistic tendency have a, a neural inefficiency in their magno system, but not in their parvo system. So that's at least one measure. So we've, we've probably succeeded in getting partway to answering some of these questions. But if you think about the idea of neural efficiency, that is recovery in order to fire again, then psychophysically we should be able to measure flicker 
and there's a thing called a critical flicker fusion frequency. Normally it's done with really, really, really bright lights and then they increase the flicker rate until you can't see the flicker as being different from a steady light. So we did the same sort of thing except we um, used varying depths of modulation and plotted, this is another group, uh, group high in a, uh, AQ, low in AQ, and again, from the predict prediction coming from increased second order responses in the, in the first slice of the second order kernel, we figured that at highest frequencies the M pathway does better than the P pathway, hence when you're at the limit of perception, you're actually measuring M pathway response at least, at least at low contrast. Remember the Parvo system does actually contribute when you get to higher and higher contrast and it's something again that's missing in the literature. In a study which actually preceded the last couple, um, but I just thought it was worth noting, you can see this in paper and brain, we took some of these physiological differences, uh, low contrast, first order responses between high and low autistic tendency, these are T values plotted along the bottom of the difference, and the first slice of the second order response, you can see a very characteristic delay, which we don't really know how to interpret, but it's measurably reproducible in groups high in autistic tendency compared with low. And this is a high contrast, black and white, basically on a, a CRT screen, um, and it, significant. So we took some of these uh, wave characteristics and a little bit of motion data and could predict class membership with about 85%. So we could predict just from um, uh, VP data with a little bit of motion psychophysics to about 85% um, correctness class membership in a fluffy scale, if you know, from a social behavioural sense. A bit like the ECHO paper I, I showed before. Okay, so we don't want to stand still here. We want to try and take as many different um, ways of looking at autistic tendency and see if we can shape uh, an answer about what's going on. And so the next task that we looked at is a very nice one. It's called the um, the diamond illusion, I don't know whether you're aware of it, but it's a neat motion illusion which has very, very strong global and local percepts, which I'll show in the next time. But um, imagine you take a frame like this, a diamond shape, and move it like this underneath three occluders that happen to be the same colour as the background. Then indeed what you have is four line elements which might be seen to be moving up and down or might be seen to be moving uh, together in a global sense, a group sense, back and forth like this. And uh, Fang Fang from uh, Peking University did a really neat fMRI experiment where participants were sort of trained up to be able to switch between the two percepts and they were in the, in the scanner and they pressed a button whenever they went from um, uh, non-diamond to diamond, so from, from this to this or from this to this. And when they did that, the lateral occipital complex, you might expect that some sort of global object will, would cause activation in LOC, and indeed that was the case. So when they went from non-diamond to diamond, LOC activation goes up, and when they go from diamond to non-diamond, diamond LOC activation goes down. But what really is interesting is in V1, striped cortex, and you get an exactly reciprocal sort of pattern of activation. So when you go from non-diamond to diamond, non-diamond V1 is highly activated. When the diamond is, is there, V1 activation is actually less, and vice versa. So I said we'd show something here just to keep the, the folks awake, and hopefully you'll be seeing something like this, correct? I, I don't know how to describe it, so I just have to make these sort of hieroglyphs. So what I'm going to do is, you'll see there's a fixation cross there, an X, 
I want you to keep looking at the X, and the X is going to march across the screen, okay? So ready, set, go. And there goes the X. Okay, now keep watching the X and think, what is that object doing? Did it change? Yes? So now it appears to be doing this. Now, Laurent Sauron Chiffrard in 1992 actually realised there was some difference in, in peripheral versus central, which they put down to some idea about receptive field size, which I think is probably wrong. What we did was to take this task and with group high in autistic tendency and low, just like before, um, we asked a question, rather than in this way, which is a bit hard, you'd have to say, you know, when push a button when it changes percept, a bit hard. So what we did is we uh, did the following. We asked the question, look at a spot here, we're going to put a stimulus up and tell us what your initial percept was. Was it global or was it local? And you notice, firstly, that everyone becomes more global in the periphery, just like we've seen in the demonstration before. But what we also found is that the low AQ group um, at any um, eccentricity, so this is uh, visual field eccentricity in degrees, at any one eccentricity, the uh, low AQ group was more local than the high, uh, sorry, uh, was more global than the high AQ group. I keep getting mixed up. So the percent global here is lesser for the high AQ group at any, any particular eccentricity. Finally, we come to, well, it's not really finally, but, but we're moving on to yet another one of these many things. You can probably think up many other things. We'll come to that in a moment. But one place that we chose to look at saccadic suppression. Now, does everybody understand what saccadic suppression is? So if you go to the bathroom, look in the mirror, and try and see your eyes move, you can't. This was noted by Dodge in 1900, a long time ago. But the, the mechanisms of it are still um, disputed. The sight and the visual pathway is also perhaps disputed. It's thought to be somewhere between geniculate and cortex, perhaps. But on the other hand, there are very few papers with very small populations that have been checked. David Bird, John Ross, and Conchetta Moroni um, published a paper in Nature in 1995, and I reprinted this because it's in colour in the 2001 TINS, TINS paper. What they did is they set up a, the appearance of a grating. So the way it's typically measured is you look at a dot, that dot goes out, another dot comes on, you make a rapid saccade, and you either present a grating with a certain contrast uh, uh, during the saccade or outside the saccade period, you measure essentially by some means or other a contrast threshold or contrast sensitivity. Um, and when they did that, they did this with some uh, quite a, an amazing range of spatial frequencies from about point less than less than 0.02 cycles per degree. Now I'm not exactly sure how you get a grating of such a low spatial frequency on a screen like that, but I presume it's only part of a grating. The Film dots here are for achromatic grating presentation and they are looked at, this is outside a saccad, they've got very, very high contrast sensitivity. So that's one divided by threshold, very high contrast sensitivity compared with when the grating was presented during the saccad. The open circles here are for chromatic gratings and they found no difference. These are two participants out of the three that were published. And so we decided to look at this in um, high versus low AQ, because it seemed to be doing some good things at consistently getting differences. And so we took something around here, 
uh, and the second grading frequency at higher, higher spatial frequency. And we made a, an alternate force choice um, uh, situation where a grating would appear, remember this is uh, sort of a Gabor edged grating, so it's very diffuse, it doesn't have edges, um, and it appeared in one of four places. And so the people had to make a four-way alternate force choice about which location it was presented in. And on the basis of uh, getting it correct or incorrect, we would adjust the contrast using a, a pest routine. And we did that for uh, presentations within the saccade or when we um, actually delayed presentation until after the saccade was completed. When we did that, uh, and the, <coughs> the colour code here still stays the same, green is low AQ, red is high AQ. It's uh, uh, also set up here, so this is low spatial frequency with the coarse grading, this is high spatial frequency. And these are 95% confidence, in confidence intervals. And you can see here that clearly that the Burr, Ross and Moroni uh, uh, finding about saccadic suppression only seems to hold for the high Q group, it doesn't hold. These are definitely not, not significantly different. There's a slight difference, but it's not significant um, for the low AQ group. So there's a very great difference in the degree of saccadic suppression or the nature of saccadic suppression. But we decided to go a little bit further than that, just psychophysically. So we set up a physiological experiment at the same time to try and measure differences. Now, using the same technique as before, that is a multifocal, or in this case it's a unifocal, there's only one patch, but it's huge, it's 50 degrees wide and it's 8 degrees high, and it's going on and off in a pseudo-random sequence. And we had two conditions, one in which they would look at, you'll see there's two little red dots. There's a red dot there and a red dot there. The two dots are well inside the overall extent of the stimulus. And they would either, under fixation condition, just look at one dot for 30 seconds and would stop recording. They'd look at the other dot, we'd start for another 30 seconds, we'd get four minutes of data. The other condition was where we would make some CADs about at this rate for 30 seconds. Now you think, oh, that's pretty easy. But once you do that and do it again another um, eight times, it actually is a bit tiring on the eyes, but we gave them sufficient rest and then we compared the data. So here's a complicated graph, I'm afraid. Um, let's see, first order, first slice of second order. So this is the one we found, we were looking at magno contributions from in the Fovial experiment before, and this is the second slice of the second order response where we were talking about a, a particular contribution. This is low visual stimulus contrast, this is high, this is black and white. Um, and the dashed lines are for the saccade condition, the solid lines are for the fixation condition. But it's very hard to understand four lots of curves all at once. There are some interesting things that I will reflect on. Um, and one being the fact that we're getting recordings here that are at times, you know, from about 10 to 30 milliseconds after stimulus onset, which is interesting. Um, you might consider the fact that we've got a huge stimulus going back and forth and perhaps, and we think very likely, the geniculate is contributing uh, even though you would normally not record a large geniculate response. If, if you're phasically stimulating the geniculate and recording you know, 17,000 uh, repetitions, so you're getting a lot, of, a lot of averaging, then we think it's very likely that this is geniculate um, response. So I'll pick on a few things. Firstly, what we did is we subtracted the, the uh, fixation mi minus saccade data. And looking here, we find in the low contrast um, uh, evoked responses that only in the high AQ group was there any uh, 
significant excursion away from zero in the early period of stimulation. So see where the lines get thicker there, that's essentially at 95% confidence interval that the red curve is away from the zero line. The green curve doesn't do that. Now, that's interesting because we know that um, in our hands, in the VEP, cortical activity seems to turn on at about 42 or 43 milliseconds. So this is evidence that there's something going on pre-cortically. Um, a little further evidence of that, we blew up the high contrast data early on, and so this is blown up and also separated. And you can see what looks like a pretty similar sort of waveform. What I'm, I put it up there for is to have a look at the standard error wave around the fringe, around the mean waves. And you'll notice it's very tight <coughs> until about, <coughs> excuse me, 40 milliseconds after the stimulus onset. And then the standard, standard error becomes quite a lot larger for each of those things. And I think that's sort of the transition between geniculate and cortical um, signals that we're recording. Okay, the second item is really what we see across all kernels and across both the high and low AQ group is a period from 80 to 160 milliseconds where we get significant, uh, if you like, physiological evidence of when suppression is, is occurring, when the, the signal is altering at least. Does that correspond to suppression? Good question. What I'm pointing out here though is that while the first order and the second order kernels were, were different in the stuff I originally talked about, in the saccad versus fixation situation, these are not, not identical, but as soon as you realise that there's typically um, a sign inversion between first order and second order responses, you'll realise that these actually are pretty similar. We're still working on trying to interpret that. So, <coughs> back to our original problem of trying to uh, work through this whole um, part. There are many other, I'm sort of trying to wind up now, because there are many other things that one could do, and we've done some of them. Um, one of the que so I'm going to raise a series of questions, if you like, to try and um, lead to the end. In terms of global local, um, the Navon figure has been used perhaps most of all, but it presents a problem to people, for instance, who might be imaging, uh, trying to image differences, because the S and the F almost certainly going to you know, activate the visual word form area. There's going to be some activation that's common bet between global and local forms and it's going to make it more difficult to look at. You have perhaps to search for different stimuli that get away from that notion. One such thing might be to look at you know, fishes, trucks and butterflies made of simple geometric shapes because those shapes probably don't extend as far through the infratemporal um, pathway as the more complicated um, objects. Um, certainly we've had some success with trying to bias um, local and global um, uh, forms. You can blur a form and impair the local or the small form much more than the large form. Uh, you can camouflage by binary coloration and suddenly the global form is harder to see and so on. We also are looking at some of these sorts of forms. Miriam Vandenbrocker uh, from the Victor Lama Super Rolspoon um, group has done work on autism looking at essentially texture defined forms why Barack is there, is there will be seen in a moment. But one thing we do wonder about is when you, when you blur that, if you apply a, a Gaussian blur to this image here, you don't lose all luminance 
fluctuation. What you lose dramatically, though, is the global form. So somehow these sorts of stimuli, if, you, if you're trying to look for a magno or parvo input to how these work, these stimuli are almost what you'd call isoluminant in the sense that the mean luminance of the a part of the frame, if you like, is the same as the mean luminance of what's outside there. Yes, you certainly get fluctuation, but you lose the global form. Just to be there now, we can still identify Obama, even when he's been blue, for all sorts of obviously understood reasons. Where to also? Um, we've got a MIG, and we're in the process of trying to go further with this sort of question. Um, and you get very nice uh, signal-to-noise ratio with these sorts of stimuli. As you might imagine, if you average 17,000 stimuli, hey, it works, it works all right. And so you get nice visual evoked responses. You get early visual evoked responses, certainly starting around 40 milliseconds and, and so on. Um, and well, I might as well press a button somewhere here and play. That's interesting. Maybe I'll play there. Did that work? Yeah. And so over on the brain on the right here, you can see uh, considerable activation, starting and stopping, and so on. And so far, when we've looked at it, we're trying to understand the sources of the um, second order responses to see whether they're the same as the first order responses because rather than just looking at a single electrode VEP, we now have 300 sensors that are uh, sampling that magnetic signal and so we can do some source localization and certainly when we look at V1 versus MTV5, um, one thing we find that is fascinating both in the first order and the first slice and second order responses is that the timing of activation of V1 and MTV5 is almost identical, perhaps to within one or two milliseconds. Certainly I think less than is possible for the signal to go from V1 to V5 in order to cause activation. And the other thing that is very neat is that in um, MTV5 you get this very um, very phasic response. The, the, all the grey curves here are uh, individual participants, the um, black and the red curves are the uh, means, but you can see that there's very much a very phasic response in MTV5, indicative of a very transient response, I think. Okay, so I'll head towards um, finishing now. The title had the word cause in it, and it's always a frightening term to, especially to put into the title for a talk. And I meant it in a certain way. I'll try and explain that. Do saccades cause a local percept in those with high autistic tendency? Well, what we're trying to say is we, we certainly found low spatial frequencies are preferentially filtered in high AQ versus low AQ. So if you take a sort of uh, dotty sort of thing like this, if you low pass filter it, you'll get a series of um, uh, lines. If you high pass filter it, you've got some dots. You know, that's sort of standard thinking. But we know that possibly we might be getting a different percept coming all the time. Now, what would be the cause of that? Well, um, second thing is we, we found in our data that precortical suppression observed in low contrast VEP only in high AQ. So we're finding a difference in the, if you like, perhaps the underlying circuitry uh, for saccadic suppression between high and low AQ. But here's the interesting thing. We make two to three saccades per second all the time, randomly, but including micro saccades, even when we're fixating, we make tiny little saccades. And even these micro saccades, uh, Krauslitz's work is very nice in this matter that um, monkeys show suppression even during uh, micro saccades if they've, they've been managed, managed to be able to present stimuli around the times of micro saccades and look at how performance in terms of 
the monkey performing a you know, reaction time task, and they find there is a significant dip in, in uh, sorry, increase in reaction time associated with microsaccades, which is fascinating. So, you know, could an infant, you know, with uh, a saccade-induced local detailed perception grow up with an impairment in holistic perception of faces? Well, I don't know, is that plain? Oh, it is too. And you can play around and we're playing around with faces and facial expression. You can see that what's happening here is a fluctuation between uh, an old person with a rather fearful looking, fearsome looking face and a, a female who is a rather happier looking face. And it really is quite interesting. So while we don't have good um, experimental data yet to say, can we mimic or can we model the effect of a series of random saccades? Uh, it's quite a complicated process. Um, but it, it, speculatively, if you like, you can see the idea that if you're constantly being shifted towards the uh, higher spatial frequency side, it makes some rational sense that you're going to end up seeing more local. And you know, this is something that needs to be said alongside all the other theories of um, how maybe autistic perception works and so on. But I guess it's probably time to um, come to the end. So we found physiological evidence of magnocellular inefficiency in high autistic tendency. We found saccadic suppression is not, in general, preferential suppression of the magnocellular system. We found saccadic suppression appears earlier subcortically in those with high AQ. The interesting thing is those two items the, have been checked very rarely. You know, um, Bo Ross and Moroni had three participants in their Nature paper. The saccadic suppression data is about seven papers with an average of five participants. Um, nobody, of course, has looked at the issue of autistic tendency in their participants. And we can see now that there's quite a large reproducible uh, physiological difference between high and low groups. And what we're saying here, continual M suppression a few times per second is likely to lead to local perception. So uh, I'd just like to acknowledge all the various people, Sheila and actually there's another crew there, Daniel's my um, uh, second son who did a psychophysiology project and was involved in the saccadic suppression study. So thank you. Thank you, David. That was a really nice talk. Uh, does anyone have any question? Okay. H hello. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I hold it like this. Um, so, the mat maturely, the, the symptoms that you... I don't know if this is any good. So, usually what you find is mostly perceptual processes and differences in. So my, my question would be, um, since there is also evidence that there are, there are also, that, that you, for example, there, are, there is uh, evidence that flicker can, that, that cortical uh, neurons even uh, track flicker, for example. I don't know if this is good. Can you take it? Yes. It's, it's a so uh, I 
sorry about that. We were, we were having some uh, interference. Uh, if I refer back to your question um, about whether it's top-down control that is manipulating this, I would say that it's unlikely from one point of view. So, for instance, the flicker fusion frequency data, I'm not sure how you can uh, quite run a control system to be able to uh, be like that, especially when it was essentially predicted from physiological nonlinearities. However, if I come back to it and say, could something like uh, fear processing affect the overall throughput of data and affect some of the physiological parameters, I think yes. And so one thing that's uh, crucial to us at the moment is to understand how anxiety and fear processing might actually affect what you would normally think as um, afferent signal processing. So what's the best way to separate that? The best way is probably to look at some of the feed-forward type processes. Those, I think, arguably, the first spikes are probably not subject to dynamic suppression or dynamic adaptation, but they are still subject, of course, to context. So I can change the response properties of a system by changing the context of what I've asked the system to do. So if you apply fear to that, I'm absolutely fascinated about whether, the, whether something like fear, maybe running through the amygdala, maybe not, um, actually can play, can wash, if you like, a change in the, in the physiological processing of, of the brain. I'm not sure that it quite gets to answering your question, but it's as, probably as far as we can go at the moment. So there are, I think, uh, studies of certain conditions that are associated with autistic behaviours, like Williams syndrome and stuff like that, where there are noted cortical thickness differences and whole morphological differences. The, the question of, of grey matter changes in autism, I think, has not been very well handled. Um, it's partly because there are issues of um, you know, age, so are you talking about child studies and not? Is there, a, you know, is there an initial period of larger brains followed by a larger pruning? That would seem to describe the fact that there's not a good sense of um, what the right answer to your question is. In terms of tractography, it's a bit out of my field of expertise, but I'm still not aware of anything that is uh, anywhere near the sorts of tractography type questions, say, um, applying to schizophrenia or something like that, where there are stro the strong evidence of pathological change. Um, and also, I always worry about different groups in tractography. You know, if you're looking at the um, uh, anisotropy uh, effects of whether brains from different groups have different amounts of hydration. Because if you've got more or less free water in a brain, presumably it affects the anisotropy because of you know, the, the, the whole signal deriving from the ability to move more easily, protons move more easily one direction than another. And so you know, in edema, for instance, in brain edema, you, you'll get absolutely reduced uh, fibre tracing ability. Is that reasonable? Thank you.